but any of the, the students here right now, um, let's ask your questions first and then we'll, we'll move on to the, the general public questions. Sure. Oh, just a sec. Do I need to give the questioner the microphone? Yeah, okay. Well, excuse me. Hi, my name is Lauren. I'm a first year graduate student at UB. And I was just wondering how much would um, carbon emissions actually decrease if we, I guess, had more um, natural gas production? Gee, I don't, have the, I don't have the numbers with me, but if we want to compare them, for example, to uh, carbon emissions from from coal, it's about half the emissions from coal operations. It's about a third less than you would find in, in oil, for example. So it depends on the trajectory, but you know who keeps track of that, and they have nice tables, is eia.doe.gov, and, and in their annual energy outlook, they'll show you the different carbon emissions and from where they're coming from in terms of the transport sector, even the fuel type, too. And so you could do readily look yourself and see see how they're, how they're equating that. And it depends on our trajectory. I mean, we could have, I really believe we're going to see more natural gas than they're showing. I just think that we have to, I, I think we will just in industrial processes, if nothing else. But um, uh, it's a lot less. And it is the, compared to the other two fossil fuels, significantly less. Okay. Okay, another student question or? Oh. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Hi, my name is Vera and I'm also a first year graduate student. I would like to ask about the employment prospects because from what you have explained, it seems like it's a very complicated process that has to be performed at the rig. And I would imagine that the workers employed there would need some spe special skills. So what's the percentage of the local people employed and what is the percentage of the increase in jobs of people that actually move into a state from somewhere else that have the special education? Well, I, I think that would vary. Initially, you'd get uh, experienced people probably from nearby Pennsylvania right now in New York, but you'd also use a lot of, it's not just the direct employment, but it's also the indirect employment as a consequence of the operations um, and, and in, induced employment. Uh, the, uh, for example, just from the food people have to be supplied or uh, the natural gas operations themselves and then the folks that supply the steel and it, it really does snowball. So there are different estimates of how much. I was out in, um, in Wyoming a couple of years ago and uh, visiting, or in Colorado, visiting some natural gas operations out there and I was asking about employment because there was a young intern from college out there, and she was, oh gee, she had been two years, two summers with them, and she had a, a degree in biology and was working there because the, the pay was good. And I, I said, well, what are you going to, you know, how, I was asking her manager, I said, well, wh he said, I hope she stays. I, I hope to keep her on these rigs. And I said, well, what are you going to pay her? And he said, well, I think I'll start at 97, but I, I better get, I'm going to give her a bonus of 20 if she signs with us. So I thought, wow, well, that's, and that's, I was, I was amazed. Of course, it's out in the middle of nowhere, uh, and it's, you know, can be a, a challenging life, I think, sometimes for, for someone that young. But she did a, a wonderful job, and they wanted to keep her. So the industry is looking for people in all sorts of fields. Uh, this natural gas operations would be looking, they'd look, be looking for accountants. They'd be looking for finance people. You, you name it, they'd be looking for construction, for truck drivers, for just about everything you can conceive of that would try to would that would be supportive of it. So it's not just the one job in the industry itself. It would be all of the other jobs that it would support in the process in a community. When uh, you're going to have a natural gas operation and you're looking to stay here years, families come and they stay, and it's their livelihood. So I, I don't think you really have to worry about uh, Texans coming up here and spending a few months and going home. I, I think you're going to have a real community of people here, and most of them will be employed from this area. Okay, thank you. Sure. Okay, any other student questions? Ah. Ah. Hi, my name is Melissa. I'm also a graduate student in the UB um, geology department. My question for you is, what effect do you think 
developing in the Marcellus Shale has on the possibility of the U.S. being more sustainable? I mean, if we didn't develop an air, what renewables oh. would we have gotten well, further along with? I, I don't know how you'd make up for half of the natural gas we're going to need. Uh, you know, that I showed in that one slide, it's going to make up for half the gas we're going to need within 20 years. So that is a substantial, half the gas we need in 20 years, I don't know, is about 15% of the U.S. energy needs. You're not going to get that from renewables. We would have to, we would be importing that. We would be much more dependent on other sources and very expensive too because it would be liquefying it, it would be brought from tanker from other countries, it's, it, it would not be cheap. Uh, it wouldn't be anything close. So, so not only are we going to get this supply, but all of the gas that we use, not just the shale gas, is, is going to be less than it ever would have cost us. And so we get the jobs, we get the energy security, and we get a, a low-carbon fuel. So that's why it's, it's such a win for us, and it's magnificent to have the technology that allows us to do it. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other? Oh. So, I'm not sure it was worth it. You don't know that yet. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah. Hi, I'm Amanda. I'm a third year PhD student in the UB Geology Department. Oh, good. Thank you for coming and giving this talk. Um, I was wondering when you showed, uh, when you talked about the worldwide reserves of shale, mm -hmm. and I think you said that. Um, if we went ahead with our current uh, energy use, that we would have about 60 years? That's the latest estimate, but Chris, as you know, that'll change and probably yes. grow. Uh, but right now, in the roughest estimates out there, and they're very rough, really, mm -hmm. so has it about, uh, I think, 6,350 trillion cubic feet, and the world's consuming about 110 trillion cubic feet a year, so if you do the division, I think it's near 60 or so years. I, yeah, I was, um, and, and I know that that's, um, you know, you get kind of speculative when you start going that far ahead in the future. But sure. I was wondering, does, um, does the API have a, a, a very long-term um, plan, or does it just get into too, sm too much speculation after, um, you know, if we, if we stay with like 60 years of um, deriving gas from the, from the shale? Um, Oh, what's, what's after that? Kind of. I don't know if, you're getting, if it's getting too far into the future to make any kind of speculations, but like, are, does the API have a very long-term kind of well, goal? I, well, we're a, a trade association, but our member companies are always investing for the long term for, for decades out, and they look in, at investments in those terms. They're, they're not looking, well, they'd love a quick turnaround, of course, but they're used to being in the business of looking 10, 20, 30 years down the road or more even and making investments based on what they think is going to, uh, that they can turn a profit on. So much, most of the energy that we consume, the oil, the natural gas we have today, is brought to us by investments made really many years ago, decades in some cases. And they're always looking to push that envelope, get more supplies, find ways to, to uh, ensure that we have more energy, and so far they've been very successful doing that. So each time we think, you know, for many years we thought we we're going to run out, well, first it was coal, now we think oil, and I'm sure, you know, folks will, and they are finite resources someday. We'll never really run out of them because of economics. What we'll do is we'll plateau and we'll, we'll gradually, we'll migrate to different kinds of technologies and different fuels. We're not going to run out of fuels. We can just look at the sun and know that. Um, so, but who knows, the second half of this century, the first half is pretty easy to kind of look at and maybe not be so far off. The second half, I, I don't know what that's going to look like, but many of you might see it. I don't think I will. <laughs> well, I doubt it. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Oh, hey, another student question. Good job. Hi, my name is Dan. I'm a senior undergraduate at UB. Um, I was wondering how, from the reference uh, production to all out like um, Marcellus or like shale production, how would that like matriculate down to an average person's like gas bill or their savings? Well, I'm, I was just looking, and that last slide gave gave a kind of an idea. Um, uh, it means your bills are going to be less than they otherwise would have been for the. Uh, 
for the for the delivered cost, of course, about half the price you pay, or more than half the price you're paying uh, at home for your fuel, for example, is, is the transportation of it, the movement of it. So uh, that price differs from the exploration and development cost and that upfront cost of that $10, $11 that was in that reference case. But it does mean about 27% less. So my guess would be 10, 15% less for everybody in the nation using natural gas for many years to come. Um, I'm not saying that will happen. That's their forecast. That's a model based on some assumptions that they have about how much resources we're going to be able to access. And actually, their case is um, based on, on reserves of 627 trillion cubic feet, and, and their latest has 827, and they're, they're looking to ramp that up. So it could be possibly less than that. It'll depend on competition, how much the price of oil is. And, uh, and other fuels coming into the marketplace, and policy, too. How much policy will be subsidizing, say, wind, solar, geothermal, and some other fuels? And they'll be in competition in the electric sector with, with natural gas. And coal, you know, what's going to happen to coal? But coal looks big, and it's because it's so cheap, relatively cheap. And that's why we've been using it for so many years. Maybe one more student question, if we got one, or? Uh there you go. <laughs> uh oh. Hello again. This is a quick question. <laughs> I was just wondering what percentage of the total natural gas resources in the shale you can actually get out with the hydrofracking procedure? Gee, I don't know. Um, there were just only just starting this, so I don't know. I don't, John, would you know the answer to that? I heard a 20% I mean, estimate. I, I mean, Mike. I don't know. The, the, num the number being used now is roughly 10% of okay. the gas is flowing. 10%. Right, they're just, they're just now starting it, so I, I think it has many years to go. Great, okay. Let's move on to um, questions from the, the general audience. Well, there's one more. Are you a student? Or we, oh, he, boy, he's fast, isn't he? <laughs> okay. So general audience questions now. Yeah, well, this field's growing so fast, you've got, got to be fast, I guess. Um, a couple of questions that I had. One is if you're listening to, uh, trying to be informed on this issue and listening to, for example, you know, radio programs that talk about this issue, there's inevitably someone who calls in, like from Texas, who works in the industry, and uh, they say things like, well, we've been using these techniques in Texas for decades, mm -hmm. and we haven't had any problems. But from what you've been saying tonight, these techniques have started relatively recently, and they've, their use has grown exponentially. I so could it really be correct that these techniques have been used as they are now for decades? Well, that's a good question, and I wasn't clear on that because uh, the process of fracking has, has gone on for about 60 years or so, but it's vertical. And the, and the breakthrough has been combining that technology with that horizontal technology. And we've been done horizontal drilling. We never combined the two, and it wasn't done. It, they were not able to do it economically until very recently. So it's combining those two technologies that has allowed you to, to really, if you think of it, you just have that vertical bore. You're only going to access quite a bit less natural gas or, or oil from that. But if you're extending out, like that show, like the video showed 10,000 feet or more, you can access a heck of a lot of natural gas, even if the process itself can be expensive to get to, you can still make a, a big return, and that's, that's the difference. Combining those technologies, both of them have been around, uh, especially the fracking, uh, about a million wells. So the Texans are real used to this technology, and I think it's brand new in the Northeast, pretty much. Uh, even though the first shale gas well was drilled here, uh, the idea of it is new, and I think you have many more questions, many more concerns in this part of the world than you have in Texas. They've been, it's second nature to them, and they've had their questions answered. Well, um, the other question that I had is, there's been some news recently that these hydro, these horizontal hydrofracturing techniques have been tried in oil exploration. Like oh, yes. going back to some old wells, and apparently yes. the results 
um, have, have been very amazing. So there's a possibility that this might take off in oil production. Oh, sure. And, and what I'm wondering is, especially since we live here on the Great Lakes, you know, and we're very cautious with our fresh water. Sure. How is there going to be enough water to hydrofrack all these natural gas wells and the, the oil wells, I mean, in, in terms of getting the water there, finding enough water, recovering the water, cleaning up the water, I mean, couldn't that become in itself a limiting factor in how much this technology can be used in natural gas and oil? It, it probably would depend, certainly on the location. I know there's a lot of concern about the volume of water, and it is a lot of water, but um, I've looked at, for example, one estimate. When you look at the Barnett Shale, which, which is really taken off, it provides about 6% right now of our nation's natural gas. And you could, you could do 10 times that amount here in New York State and still only use the equivalent of maybe half, half the water you're using for rec recreational purposes like golf uh, courses. So I think there's plenty of water for what the industry has in mind in terms of how fast we can ramp up. And the real, one of the real issues is, is managing that water. Uh, there's a lot of water that comes back out of the, the well when it's drilled. And how are you going to manage that wastewater is, is the primary issue. But in terms of oil, yes, oil has been big. And shale oil in the, in the Dakotas right now, it's huge. Uh, we have three, four billion barrels because of this technology. So and we're on to the next stage. What they used to call unconventional is becoming conventional. And the United States has a lot of energy, a lot of oil, a lot of natural gas, because of the technology. Yeah. Keep in mind, uh, you know, we are, we are going to have seven other, other speakers, especially for this kind of question, who sure. are experts in that particular thing. Um, and you know, know a lot so, more than I do about it. Yeah, so keep that in mind. You'll get some really good answers um, as, we, yes. as we go along. How close are the wells spaced? Well, how close are the wells spaced? Um, I don't know. It de depends on the well site. You know how many how many pads you have on on a particular site. Um, it would depend on the geography. It depends on the distance. You know there are a lot of rules and regulations in terms of where you can site wells and where you can't and. And so it really would depend on the geology and the regulations. So I, I really, I'm really sorry I can't answer that in any depth. But you will have people here who can and who will talk about it uh, quite a bit. Uh, this is a lot of exercise for you. <laughs> yes. I believe you indicated um, that API and, and the work that you do is pretty much representative of a group of companies um, and, and your position is largely uh, uh, putting the best foot forward for them, is that correct? Well, no, well, actually my job for, I've been with the American Petroleum Institute for oh, 25 years or more and most of the time it has been in energy markets and explaining what's happening in oil markets and much of the information as you saw tonight all of virtually all of it except a handful of slides at the end was Department of Energy data and so I really try hard on my job I do come from the perspective of the oil and gas industry but I try hard to rely on hard facts and when facts change I use the latest data I can and as a matter of fact I spend my life updating data all the time so uh, I can hear where you're coming from, but I, I like to think that I am here to present an honest, open, and objective view of the resources, the possibility, and the benefit that it can bring us. And that, that is, that's what I've tried to do tonight. Okay. My follow-up on that is um, we're all pretty much familiar with large petroleum companies that are involved in a lot of different uh, types of uh, products that they develop. But um, in the natural gas field, aren't there a whole nother uh, group that's uh, uh, smaller companies 
that are involved in exploration of natural gas? Or, well, or is it still the same uh, large uh, petroleum companies that well, we're we, familiar with? We, we have a, a real mix of different size companies. And as you know, a lot of big companies that you recognize, Exxon, Chevron, all of those companies. But then even in the production of, of, of oil, for example, we have really, I, I think, hundreds, hundreds, maybe up to thousands of different small, small companies, you know, one, two wells. They produce 15% of our oil. They're very important. They're actually very important in the Gulf of Mexico, these small producers of oil and natural gas in the Gulf. So we have a very diverse group out there, the majors, small independent operators, and the same thing in the gas, and you'll see that here. And more and more you see the major companies, major world companies, looking to invest in this, uh, in this region and in other shale regions around the country because they do see it as a future. And the smaller companies got in first, but they're looking to, to uh, get in on it as well. And uh, they think it's going to be important. And so we have a mix, di mix of uh, different kinds of companies. Um, and uh, sometimes they have different views on, on, on things, but uh, that's what it is. And it, it really allows for a lot of competition. It's a good system. We have two traveling mics now. So. Oh, good. So you don't have to run around. <laughs> From one Brockport grad to another. Oh, so. gee, probably the same year. <laughs> I'm much older than you are. <laughs> As I like, just like to say is that the... I've been involved in the, uh, the chemical industry for a lot of years, and, and uh, I was listening to a conference today with the American Chemistry Council, ACC, mm -hmm. which is you know, very similar to the API. But mm -hmm. I think the important thing here is that uh, it's all, you're almost at a disadvantage getting the message out. Oh, you think? <laughs> very much so. And the message is clear. The message is clear from... The ACC, the message is clear from the API, the message is clear of a lot of these, these different industry groups. But how do you, how do you balance or how do you, how do you get that information to the public in a, in a clear sense when the, when the media itself may not be listening to you or, it's, or not interested in your, your message? I know. For the most part, it's, it's kind of dull stuff to most folks. And it's not that interesting, and when the news tries to make it interesting, there's always good guys and bad guys, and, and, they, and it, it leaves out a lot of facts in between. We have, we've tried a lot of different things. We're doing, I don't, I don't know if you'll see them here, but we do a lot of advertising, try to have short little sound bites that try to get out messages that we think can resonate with folks talking about uh, drilling, for example, or resources that we have, and you'll see some of them on the Sunday talk shows, for example. We get out, we talk to communities as much as we can. We talk to anybody who's willing to listen to us. We, we talk to, uh, uh, and we do a lot of focus groups to try to understand what people are thinking, how they think about things, and, and what might resonate and what doesn't, and, and why. But it's, uh, it's been, it can be a hard sell, and it can be very frustrating because I really do think we have to have a very informed debate on the subject. We have to start with fundamental facts. That's why I was really pleased to have a chance to come here today. And it was emphasized to me more than once, you know, that, that, that this, this lecture series is about just that. And we want you to just give that overview and make it straight and, uh, and make it true. So, we, but you're right. It's a hard sell. It's not a very sexy subject. And, and when it is, it's usually... Uh, pit it with uh, a lot of misinformation out there, an awful lot of misinformation. It's very frustrating because usually the answers are a lot longer than the accusation and a lot more complicated. And if you sit through all of these series that they're going to have, I think you're going to know more than just about anybody about this issue. And I think you really will get, uh, get the straight information from the, the people they have lined up to come after me. So I hope that helps if you, you come in the future. You'll, you'll learn more than I know, I bet you. And of course, we pound the halls of Congress all the time. But. Hi, Larry Snyder, UB grad. <laughs> I, uh, just to follow up, uh, what, what, is your, what do you think is the, the misconceptions of the media? What do you think is the, the, the top misconceptions the media is displaying today? 
Oh, I don't know. Let me count the ways. Well, I, I spend a lot of my time just talking about uh, oil prices, for example, and that's, geez, there's just, just a lot of animosity around that topic, a lot of frustration, a lot of anger, and I think politicians play into some of that anger. Uh, you'll hear the terms, oh, they're price gouging us, as if companies can just make up the price and, and decide they're going to charge more. And rather, just, rather than just using fundamental basic information about supply, demand, a global economy, where we are, what that means, and it, and it really is very straightforward and you really can explain these prices and there's no excuse for some of this. So you'll hear folks come out with price gouging accusations. Now the most recent one we've heard in the past week or so is that we have a lot of leases that we're not using as an industry. So, so government's now going to provide incentives for using these leases, but the incentives are extra fees and cutting back on the lease time. Now a lease is given to a company, first they have to have a, they, they bid on it. So they'll often pay billions of dollars for a lease. And that gives you the right, about five to 10 year term, to explore and develop that lease. Well, uh, generally you'll have 100 leases and only one of them, one out of 100, will be economically and technically feasible. But all of that time you have the lease, you, you pay rental fee, and you've also put down a lot of money for the bonus bid. But now it's being used by some in Congress and elsewhere to say, well, oil companies are deliberately sitting on their leases. Now, nothing could be further from the truth. And I find that really frustrating because I think we really have to have uh, truth in the discussion someplace. So uh, you, can, you can touch on just about any part of the subject, and I, I can go on about it. I've heard it all, and uh, there's just, just a lot that isn't clear out there to a lot of folks, and, and mostly just misinformation, hard feelings about high prices. We hear a lot about profits in the oil industry. They make a fortune. They make tens of billions of dollars every quarter. They do. They spend hundreds of billions every quarter bringing the product to market. They make about seven cents on every dollar of sales. U.S. manufacturing makes 8.6. That's a five-year average, and it's been a good five years, pretty much, for the industry. So that idea of scale, of misinformation, of not giving folks the facts on where we get our energy, uh, energy independence. People treat this idea as if, if you're energy independent or oil in independent, your price is going to go down. That's not true. We could be entirely independent of foreign sources for all our fuels, or especially for oil. And we would still, our price would be dictated by the world's supply and demand, not what we have, by the world. And so this idea that somehow we're going to pay less for our energy if we subsidize other high-cost energy and uh, we, we get off oil is, is false. So I could go on, but I won't. Don't get me started. Uh, I've been uh, studying uh, the use of alternative uh, energies, uh, meaning biomass uh, energies, and have been impressed with uh, how effective they can be. I know there's still an issue about cost. Uh, one of the things when I look worldwide at the, uh, at the deployment of some of those uh, resources uh, that is actually embarrassing here in the United States is that we don't have any articulate energy policy and have not had an articulate energy policy relative to other developed economies. And I'm wondering, it appears to me that some of the uh, statistics that are developed here would be uh, skewed very much in different uh, directions, uh, potentially, uh, were we to have a, a more uh, defined energy policy. Uh, so would that, in a sense, potentially change the equations that you're using in terms of your projections out to 2035 and beyond. Oh, sure. I think policy does does make a difference. But uh, even with policy, say very supportive policy that would, it's already heavily subsidizing. Say, for example, ethanol is heavily subsidized. Let's let's continue that subsidy for oil, for wind, for solar, for some of these other fuels. And they're already there. Some of the subsidization. But let's think that we would we've double that. So instead of 14 percent of our energy needs. Uh, we might get 30% of our energy needs in 20 years, and that would be magnificent. That would be a 600% increase. I don't think 
that we could get there that fast, but maybe we could. Maybe there'll be breakthroughs in some of the technology. So maybe that picture that EIA shows will differ. Will differ. They tweak that every month, and the annual energy outlook, of course, is annual, and they tweak it every year. They're not f so far different than all estimates around the world. If I showed you the world's estimates for fuels, it, it's actually the slope of the curve is 50% is more energy the world's going to need in 20 years. I don't know how we're going to do it. Um, and, and as an industry, I think the oil and natural gas industry is actually very supportive of renewable fuels and has have invested in it. They invest the lion's share of their income in, in oil and natural gas, but they are looking at a portfolio of fuels and technology into the future. Some of the big, biggest investors in solar, for example, is oil. Uh, ExxonMobil is putting their money in algae. They think it could be a real fuel of the future. They don't have much faith in where, how far we can get with ethanol, or even cellulosic, but they are do think that that could be a promising fuel. That could change, and uh, that could change rapidly. We, we just we can't see that. So you're right, the picture could change, but I think 20 years is not going to be so much different than, than what EIA shows, much as if you looked at the earlier slide of, of the folks who were so concerned about coal, they were pretty right about the next 20 years. They didn't see oil coming on so fast, and they might not have seen natural gas at all, but you, you kind of have a good horizon. You, you know where you are, you know where technology is. You know just the turnover of the vehicle fleet alone, even if we had a big breakthrough in, say, uh, uh, electric uh, uh, fuel cells, for example. It'd still, still take time. Picture can change, it is promising. We have a lot of energy, but I think heavily subsidizing energy, making it more expensive than it otherwise would be, we have to think about that too. Um, but I'm all for incentivizing it. Oil companies actually spend more and invest more oil and natural gas in these fuels than all other industry combined and than the federal government. So they are among the biggest investors in technologies and, and zero and low carbon emitting fuels. And they're looking to that future too. We had a question back here. Uh, great job. I, I love your presentation. I'm extremely impressed. Thank you. He's my brother-in-law. Uh, well, actually, full disclosure. <laughs> don't don't start. Full disclosure. This is not a planted question. Um, no, I had a quick one regarding the uh, slide on. I think it was upwards of 400 million per year New York State tax uh, potential, and I was just wondering yes. what the federal. Um, it's almost was. Um, it's almost equal. Uh, the the way the the model had worked, I think it's about half and half. So the state would get about half, and the, the feds about half in that model. So uh, so that would be the answer to that. And, and he, used a, he used a model with fairly conservative assumptions and, and, uh, and a model that's used by a lot of folks, an input-output model. So um, I, I think his estimates were pretty reasonable. I, too, agree. Your presentation is great. Thank you. We're large landowners in the southern tier of oh. western New York. Of course, we have a great interest in this. Sure. Um, we don't want to wreck the environment. Uh, we'd like to make some money if we could sure. without doing that. Um, how would one go about choosing a good contractor? A good what? A, a good person to come in and drill, to do the oh, drilling. Oh, a good contractor. I mean, where do you look? I mean, where do you go? I mean, there's, there's shabby people in any industry. Yeah, who and then there's trust? good ones. Well, would you know? He has a card. <laughs> I don't have a. I don't. I, I don't have a card with me. But uh, gee, you know, you, you're going to have to do your research. If you own land there, you you make sure you do your research. But I think it was part of this series. I think. Am, am, am I mistaken? Aren't you going to have someone that's going to talk about uh, contracts and land and? And, and get into some of the details of this, and I think that's the person, you, that's the lecture you want to come to and hear. Sure. Uh, because I, I really can't tell you. Also, do you know what parts of New York State that the Marcellus Shale Formation would hit county-wise, maybe? Yeah, I, th I think there was a picture of it in my presentation. Let's see. Um, let me go back. So it goes, it goes uh, if you know your counties, and I can hardly read this, but um, 
I'm, I'm interested in Allegheny County. <laughs> there you are, Allegheny County, where you're, you're bumping up against the operations that are going on down here in Pennsylvania. Here you are in Allegheny, and uh, you're, you're right in the thick of it. It doesn't thin out the Marsalis until you get w up beyond that. So you're in a good spot. And, Thank you. And you're close, to <laughs> you're, you're close to a lot of operations already going on. So... I don't know. I think you want the best deal, don't you? I mean, you want the best for the acreage. You want the best terms, and you want, you know, and you want to go go with go with that. Is there a website, maybe? Um, no, not that I not that I not for that. Not that I'm aware of. There may be, uh, and I'm sure that there are different law groups out there and different representatives out there. But I'm I'm not aware of it, and and I think you really do want to be f here for that session. It'll talk about that, and I bet that speaker will be able to give you some good direction. But it's something right. I, I just don't know about. Ray, so I'm that speaker. Oh, the, here he yeah. is. Okay. The, the gentleman yeah, down he's here right is here. the speaker. So. Oh, you're going to be the speaker? <laughs> well, help him out. Give him a little teaser or something. <laughs> so he'll come listen to you. Hi, Riola. I have a simple question, I think. The, you mentioned in some of your slides imports of natural gas, and I'm wondering where those imports come from. I'm thinking it's not, we're not talking about no. from Pennsylvania, you're talking other countries, correct? Other countries, that's right. We would have, I, I think we would have been getting a lot from the Middle East uh, otherwise. Uh, I th that would have been the primary source by tanker liquefied natural gas. And then we were trying to site plants offshore along the coast, uh, the northeast coast. And uh, to bring those tankers in, you, you liquefy it, you cool it down, and it liquefies it, and then brings it in by tanker. So we are now thinking we'll export to China. Yeah. Well, 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 I don't know. The Chinese are, are catching on oil shale, I mean shale, too. So we'll see. But we're not going to need to import half of our gas that we would have needed in 20 years, half the gas. So uh, to me, that's magnificent, be, just, just because we have it here. It's ours, we get the jobs, we get the revenue, we get all the pluses from it that we wouldn't have if we had to import it, and the price, so. Current direct imports come from Spanish. Right, that's right, but we were citing them for the tankers to come in from Europe. Yeah, and we get a little bit, we, we produce what, about, I wanna say over 90, 95% of our natural gas, we get some from Canada, less as time goes on. And that's why we were looking to import uh, more from abroad, because Canada wouldn't have it for us. They would have been using their own. Rayola, this is uh, Larry again from yeah, UB, former UB grad. Um, I just looking at the history, you were talking about the history of, of gas drilling, and you mentioned something like a million frack jobs have been done uh -huh. historically. Do yes. you know what percent has actually been horizontal fracking and how long that's been going on? Well, how the, many? Um, the horizontal, primarily, it's been going on since the late 90s, I think, uh, and it started in the Barnett Shale, where they combined that horizontal with the fracking to be able to access more of the resource. So that's been relatively new technology. We use it uh, in oil operations, too, and, and uh, I think it's been about a dozen years to combine the fracking with the horizontal. So it's relatively new. Relatively, okay. And as far as coming into New York, what is the projected level of intensity, like as far as <clears throat> when, you, when you come in to do a frack, how, how, how many pads are in such a square miles? Or I know there's something some called a unit or something. I was just wonder what the, what the plans were, if you know anything about I, New York. I, I don't, but, but I think, uh, uh, Michael, did you want to address that? Well, since, since I happen to have a microphone, why not? Um, in 2008, the New York State adopted new spacing regulations pertaining specifically to shale gas wells. Under the, the existing state law, you have essentially two options, well, three options. One, if you're drilling a vertical well, you can drill it on a 40-acre spacing unit. Um, there are a few early test wells that have been drilled that way. Uh, it's largely uneconomic, and so it's not very viable. The approach that companies seem to be using is to drill multiple wells, um, generally speaking up to eight, from a common pad located on a 640-acre spacing unit. Uh, 640 acres, for those of you who don't know, happens to be a square mile. So your, your well density at a maximum would be one square mile apart from wellhead to wellhead. Um, re realistically speaking, you're not going to be able to put wells in at that density because you have to take into account other factors such as wetlands, uh, creeks, proximity to roads, buildings, um, those other setback requirements that also exist in uh, state law that 
determine where you can site a well. But at a maximum density, you're looking at one mile from wellhead to wellhead. Isn't that nice to have someone that knows the answer so crisply? I had uh, two questions. One, does the quality of the gas differ from one area of the country to the other? And secondly, when the gas comes out of the well, is there any processing work that needs to be done to it before it's sent down the pipeline? I, I think so. Um, it does have to be processed. They have to take impurities out of it. And, uh, and these byproducts then they do use for other things, I think butanes and some other chemicals that they do take out and process before they put it through the pipeline. So, and, and so the qualities can, can vary around the country in the processing, I think. Question over here. Oh, right at the end. Hi, I'm Dennis Holbrook. Uh, I'm with Norse Energy, and we are one of those companies that are out exploring for oil and gas. There he is. <laughs> See, you wanted someone. <laughs> uh, no, I did not bring my card. Uh, it was referenced earlier that the technology, the hydrofracking, has been around 60 years, and it has been drilled, used in this state for 60 years, just yes. for clarification, or, yes. uh, as well as in Texas and elsewhere. Uh, you pointed out that the combination of horizontal drilling and hydrofracking uh, has really evolved over the last decade or so. Mm -hmm. And I assume, correct me if I'm wrong, that tens of thousands of wells have probably been drilled using that technology. Oh. Easily, um, okay. yes, easily, 55%, as that one slide showed, of all the wells out there are, are, have been drilled, are drilled that way right So you now. have access to EIA and a variety yes. of other sources of information. Yes. A lot of the folks in this audience, I imagine, are, are exposed to the suggestion that this is a controversial process, that it's dangerous, yes. that drinking water is at risk. Yes. Could you give us some sense, if I'm not uh, asking too much, of how many cases you've come across that have been identified where hydrofracking is ultimately contaminated drinking water? The, the hydrofracking itself has never been found by anyone to have contaminated any drinking water. The fracking process itself. And, uh, and that's, and, and this New York State's geologist just came out uh, and he said he's been looking into this for three years now. And, uh, and I also have, let's see, I brought it along because I, I thought it was interesting. Uh, EPA's director of drinking water protection, he's the head of EPA's drinking water protection division, said he's, in, and this was under testimony last year, he said he hadn't seen any documented cases that hydrofracking process was contaminating water supplies. Secretary Chu, the energy secretary, said last year that hydrofracking is safe and lawmakers should be cautious in their efforts to restrict it. Um, uh, you can get the uh, Secretary of Pennsylvania's Department of Environmental Protection the same thing. Pennsylvania has not had one case in which the fluids used to break off the gas from eight from five to eight thousand feet underground have returned to contaminated groundwater. Now that's the hydrofracking process itself, uh, but there are other issues when it comes to the waste disposal of the water, for example, cementing of the pipe when you're putting it through. Uh, that are out there, but the process itself has never been documented to, to have contaminated water. And I think that's the fear. You're going underground, you're breaking apart this shale, what's going to happen to the water supply? It's, it's really thousands of feet beneath that, uh, beneath the water. And it's done in a way that is prote to protect the water and it's managed by the state. So there aren't any cases. Uh, yet, you know, that we know in 60 years, no one's documented. And these are responsible people. These are the head of EPA. These are the head of the Secretary of Energy. And, um, and that's what they've testified to before Congress. As a follow-up, uh, uh, you've probably heard of Dimmick, Pennsylvania. Yes, and also, I have. And also uh, the, uh, some, uh, some interesting things that's gone out, you know, some uh, documentaries like Gasland and uh, NPR has done some other things. What do you, what do you think, what do you see your interpretation of all, of all that? I guess that's part of the media. I guess it's a follow-up on my other question. What, are, I mean, are, they, are, they, are these lies or are these, uh, I mean, it seems to me, you said it's, it's a play, maybe it's a play on words. You said it's the process has never been documented, but there's a lot more to the process than just drilling. It's also yes. the wastewater and it's, you know, sure, many absolutely. other items. You have to manage the wastewater um, and, and that's so. 
in terms of in terms of Dimmick and and uh, Michael was reviewing some of the stats with me this evening, and I don't know if you want to address some of some of that or not in terms of the number of of families affected, but I, I guess it was, what, six, six or so um, in the town of Dimmick who complained about their water supply, and it had something to do with the cementing job, as I understand. Uh, as far as we know, no one's come sick or ill from this, uh, but there were a half dozen or more families whose water wells uh, went bad on them, and that was attributed to the, to the gas company operating in the area. And they, they were fined, and they had to pay the fine, and, uh, and, and, so, and that's been very much sensationalized by the movie Gasland, and, and uh, primarily and by others, but uh, it, it's not a, char it's a characterization of the industry itself. Not when you have over a million wells done successfully. I think it's a mischaracterization of what's going on. But all of these operations have to be done responsibly. And when they're not, uh, folks have to be held accountable. And answers to questions have to be there. And, and folks need to know what's going on and what it means. And it has to be done safely and responsibly. And I think the industry believes in that. And they've had a very good track record, despite some sensationalism in some of these movies uh, mm -hmm. uh, that are long on sensation and very short on, on the facts. And, in that movie in particular, was roundly criticized even by the New York Times for, for that in itself. And uh, they had a reporter there that went through myth versus facts and went through the whole movie and did, a, did I think, a pretty good job looking at it and tracking down what was true and what wasn't true. And a lot of it wasn't. I, f I firmly believe the industry is going to try to do the best that they can. I, f I, re I really do believe that. But I guess, you know, we see things around the world, like the BP oil spill, of we course. see the nuclear disaster, of course, that's a different story, but I mean, the thing is, are we, as a tech, you mentioned that the technology, it's, it is wonderful, Grameen is so smart that we can create these technologies, but yeah. is the technology getting beyond ourselves? I guess that's the, I guess that's sometimes the question that, uh, and it, that, sure. that's been around for 10 or 12 years or whatever it is, you know, it's certainly, they, they have some proving, but you can understand maybe why some environmentalists, like obviously you can see where I'm coming from, might have well, concern. Course. Absolutely, sure, I mean, and, and that is the challenge for the industry, to keep up with the technology and keep up with the standards and, and have the best practices out there and make sure that everyone is following those best practices and you know what they are and they're continually, uh, part of the process at, at API is with all of these uh, different committees and standards committees, they are constantly changing and updating everything. It's, it's a lifetime job. It's, it's generation jobs, and it always is trying to tech, catch up with that. And much as uh, you'll see when we'll have, for example, a plane accident, where you go back and you think, okay, what happened? What can you change? Was it the pilot error? Why was it an error? Was it a mechanical part? And the industry does that all the time with accidents, with, with every accident. And they were very focused on, of course, the accident in the Gulf uh, in, a, in a big way. And, uh, and learned a lot from that and, and have applied that learning moving forward. So we're, we're safer than we ever were as a, as a consequence, but uh, that was a big blow. Uh, a lot of things had to go wrong on that rig to have seen that accident. And for many of the industry, it was kind of a black swan event. But nonetheless, if it happened once, it was too many times for everybody that works in this industry. So, uh, so things change. But you're right, there's risk. There's worry about those risks, and uh, folks need to understand them, uh, but also recognize that we're in the business of doing things safely, responsibly, and have a pretty darn good track record. In the Gulf, we've drilled 42,000 wells successfully without an event like that, and most people in the industry didn't think it could ever happen uh, because of the technology, because of the training, because of all these things, and that, that's changed. We now have an offshore safety institute that we formed that will be reviewing and having uh, different auditors go over everything, go over all these practices and safety procedures and, and certify everyone so that some of our recommended practices now are part of regulation and we are safer as a consequence of that. Hi. What's the current limit on the horizontal distance of these wells and what factors limit that distance? I have no idea. 
I'm sorry, I just have no idea. At least under New York state law, the, the units that are created around these wells are actually growth units. And so they, the unit gets larger as the, the technical capabilities of the operator can push the lateral well bore out further. So presently, the limitations are on the competency of the rock and the process of drilling itself, and they are not regulatory in nature. Um, John, I'll look to you in terms of total distance. Uh, 3,000, 4,000 feet is becoming a fairly standard distance. Um, as we learn more about the rock properties, as we understand the geology better, they are able to push those distances out further. Um, there are some competency issues associated with shale, so there does seem to be some type of a finite distance. What that distance is, we don't know yet. I think we're still looking for it. Uh, but presently, I would say that based on best available technology and information, we're at around 4,000 to 5,000 feet. The, the film showed 10. I yeah, I, it, yeah. It, it, a, lot of, a lot of the distance is dictated by the depth and, and the, right. the formation you're drilling into. So you, you got to remember you're drilling with a solid piece of steel pipe that you're rotating and there's a bit on the end that's driven hydraulically and it's rotating. And now we've changed some of the surface technology so that we're not just drilling with weight, we're drilling with a push down rig as, as well as the hydraulic motor at the end of the bit. So that, that length is changing every day. So, you know, historically a lot of the limit was the ability of what you have on the surface to pull it back out of the hole because you have a lot of steel in the hole and if you only have a 100,000 pound pull on a rig, you can't get it all back out. And the, the, the mass of the equipment we're using and, and the technology we're putting into the well bore, what you're going to see is further, longer laterals out of single well bores just to expose to more rock. And what that'll lead to is less and less surface activity and better performance and better economics. So the industry is pushing itself to less and less impact, better and better recovery from a single reservoir, single well. It's so handy to have these guys along. <laughs> um, you mentioned that after the oil spill in the Gulf that there is a body now called the Offshore Oil Institute. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if there exists some... Uh, offshore Safety Institute. Offshore, offshore Safety. Mm -hmm. Is there another uh, body that's watching the hydrofracturing? Oh, sure. Um, just start to finish, uh, there are regulations in the industry over every aspect of oil development or natural gas development that, uh, that you, you, you know, we're a heavily regulated industry. So we are covered under all of the environmental rules and regs out there. And especially regarding uh, states have a lot of, uh, a lot of power in that regard in terms of how they manage, for example, the wastewater from operations. A lot of that will be handled by states. So the, the Safe Drinking Water Act, for example, uh, manages underground injection control wells. These are wells where you put waste deposits from oil and natural gas. So that's part of the Safe Drinking Water Act. Uh, the Clean Air Act, we're part, of, we're part of all those acts and are regulated by that, but a lot of the management does happen at the state level. Uh, because you know, government, the federal government is not charged with implementing a lot of this. So the municipal wastewater, for example, that would be managed by state government versus federal government. As just a little promotion for the talk series, the fourth lecture in this series to be given by Greg Sobos, is at, uh, who is the former uh, director of the Division of Mineral Resources for the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, is going to give an entire talk focused specifically on uh, the regulations of the natural gas industry in New York. That should be very helpful because there's an awful lot of misunderstanding about the rules and regs out there, and it's it's difficult to uh, to answer in short sound bites. Yeah, you know, maybe there's some information because what information that I received that, that that fracking is exempt from the Clean Water Act and the Clean Air Act, federal level, and then it is up to the state level for the for, to really to, uh, I guess, control it. Is that, that, that's, is, well, is, that, is that a misinformation that's been out there, or is that true? Well, it was, actually, it was actually never part of the Safe Drinking Water Act. Fracking wasn't. 
because it was recognized that the water, for example, that comes back out of the well is managed by the state. So it was never really part of the act, but that was clarified. I think there was a case in Alabama where there was some question about that and who, who had regulatory authority and whether fracturing was covered under the Safe Drinking Water Act. And it was recognized at the time that it's a different process when you're fracking versus when you're using an underground injection control well. So that distinction was recognized, I think, and they call it the Cheney loophole, I yeah, guess, right. when That's was that, four or five exactly years ago? That. Or, or more, and that was really just in there to clarify that no, the states have preeminence, they are the ones that manage the water, they're gonna manage what happens with that water, and the, the feds have uh, control over the underground injection control portion of it, but again, you're gonna have somebody that knows a lot more about okay. me than I do okay, uh, in fine. this series, Thank and I think that they'll, they'll probably do a fantastic Thank job you. describing that. But there is under, misunderstanding about the Safe Drinking Water Act a lot. Any other, any other questions? Okay, great. Thank you very Thank much you. again for coming. Thank you very much. <laughs>